In this video, I'm going to take you step by step through the painting process to develop this beautiful rubrum lily watercolor painting. Now, before I begin the actual demonstration, there are just a few things I'd like to point out. And it's this area that I would like to discuss yellows and pale greens and much lighter in tone than the surrounding area. So what I usually do is begin with the lightest section first, then gradually work step by step to my darker areas. And in the case of this painting, I save the background washes for last. Before I actually begin, I'd just like to point out my basic setup. Here you see two palettes ready to go. The bins are loaded with, with colors that I'll be using. I see my Windsor Yellow, my uh, Scarlet Red, my Alizarin Crimson, Quinacridone Red, some of my blues. I also like, as you already know, to keep colors in these bins. I find them very useful for keeping your colors isolated and mixing. And I, I have many of them. I buy them in a the supermarket. Here, Windsor Red is in here. It's absolutely clean. Nothing gets intermixed with it. And the beauty of it is I'm able to mix large enough quantities of paint to adequately do what I need to do. When I add water to my palette, I don't dip my brush in the water and apply the paint that way. What I do is I use a squeeze bottle and I'll dispense the water that way. This way I'm always assured of using clean water. I usually lay out my drawing using a number two pencil or a number two lead in this case in my pencil holder. I love these. These are fun. I much prefer them to a pencil because then I could keep them in my pocket retract the lead. This is what I use in class. For my subject matter, I usually work directly from my computer. Even on my large canvases, I work from a, a monitor. The monitor that you see at the left is off right now, but this is a painting that it's actually complete. It's a four-foot painting, acrylic on canvas, and I view my photographic source information, that are my photographs, in a monitor that I'm able to float in front of the painting as I paint. I'm about to begin the painting and I'm going to start with the lightest areas. I intend to paint this, the center section first because it has the lightest colors as we see. So what I'll do is I'll lay in each one of these forms individually. I'll allow it to dry and then mask it out after it's completely dry. This way, I could proceed to develop what's underneath it without worrying about ruining the top layer of color. This is the area that I'm going to begin first. This wild background that you see in this photo, I played around with my Adobe and had some fun with my original photo. That's what's happening there. To begin, I've mixed a little bit of cobalt blue with Windsor Yellow to get this green. So what am I doing now? I'll go over that area again because I really want to show you how I begin. I dampen it and then at the the top of the filament where it attaches to the anther I'm gonna apply a little bit of my mixed yellow and blue. And then I'll let that simply bleed up. being pulled up by the water and it'll, it'll result when it dries in a nice transition from light to darker. Now the one thing 
that I'd like to point out, and I think we mentioned this early on, is that watercolor will only flow where the paper is wet. So what I always do is I'll dampen the section, then I'll flow in my color, leave it alone, let it dry. Now as these two filaments are drying, I can move around to another section, and I'd like to do that. Eventually I'm going to mask all that out, but let's Let's take this little detail right here. The petal that we see is divided with a central line. So the way I could approach that, and I do want to indicate the central division as we develop it, I do it in steps. And the first step will involve wetting the petal. Having wet the petal, if you can see in the photo, it modulates from a darker red to a almost white color with a bluish hint. So what I'll do next for that darker red, I like quinacridone red rose. So I'm going to mix that as my foundation color. See why I like these bins? They make it very easy and you keep the color clean. I'm going to apply my wash, ignoring that central line right now. I'll work back into that later. Now that's quite heavy so I'm going to rinse off my brush and now with plain water continue to pull the color up. I also see quite a bit of blue hint in that so while it's wet I'm going to take a little of that Windsor Blue, put it on my palette to thin it out even more. With my squeeze bottle, I just want a hint of this color. Add quite a bit of water to that. Now I'm going to flow it in. I like that modulation from the red to the blue the slightest hint of quinacridone magenta. And at that edge, I'm going to add just a little bit of that color. That is nice. So essentially, I've worked with three colors to lay in the foundation layer of this. I've worked with my quinacridone red, my magenta, and a little phthalo blue. Notice, somebody observed this in my, in my workshop yesterday, I don't brush my paint. I dampen an area, I look at my subject matter to understand the modulations that are taking place, and then I allow the color to flow on its own and interact. My philosophy is paraphrase nature, don't copy it exactly. Now, the one other thing I would like to do is I like to splatter a little bit of water into here because I see a dappled quality. I can achieve that quality two ways. One, I could add a little bit of salt to this, and that might create an interesting effect. But often that is too harsh. A way I prefer is to take a fan brush, dip it in water. I'll splatter a little bit of that water into the surface. You're not going to be able to see what's, what's going to happen until it dries, but it'll create an interesting texture to the surface. I took a little bit of salt, and I want to be careful with this. Salt can be extreme. I'll sprinkle some salt in this area. Well, I sprinkled a little more than I intended to. But we'll leave it alone. It'll be a good lesson. The salt is going to impart a dramatic look to that area. At this stage, I leave that area alone. And I can move around to one of the opposite petals that we see. But before I do that, I dampen that area. Now I'm looking at my subject studying all of the variation that I see, and I see a, 
darker area right about there. And then a concentration of the red color over here. I'm using quinacridone red rose like I used over on the other side. And this one, coincidentally, modulates to the blue in here. It lightens up. So I'm going to work that very light wash of Windsor Blue there. The variety of color is absolutely amazing. If I want, it does lighten up here. I can suck out a little bit of the paint with my Kleenex. I find Kleenex is the absolute best brand to use for lifting out color. And all of these little surface things that we see on the rubrum lily, we'll do that later. I cannot paint this at this point because it'll bleed into here and here. I can't paint this because it'll bleed into here. I can't paint this the same thing. Keep in mind, this is layer one. I'm going to work into these to create shadows, to create more detail, to create the center line. Now, I'm looking at the photo, and I see it darkens a little towards the end of the filament, where it approaches the anther. So to get the shade in there, I'm going to work a little bit of the complementary color. Let's zoom in. I will dampen the filament. Then I'm going to go to a very light quinacridone magenta. There, I picked up very little bit out of, out of my bin over here. But I want to stain the tip. Yes, that's exactly what I want to do. And then I'll flow in some water. Just to allow it to blend. I'll push it further with the water. Like that. That's good. Yes. The same thing needs to be done with the tip of this filament. I see in my photo, it gets a much deeper red here. I'm going to add some alizarin crimson to create that effect. And I'll add some alizarin crimson down here. Like you saw me do in the other petals, I'm going to use some of my Thalo Cyanide Blue or Windsor Blue for the very tip. Also, for this area here, to flow in some of that blue and let it bleed. Sometimes I like to move my paper around. I see in the petal a light area right about here. So I'm going to lift some pigment out. Could also lift it out with the brush this way. I dampen my brush with water. And now I could lift out the paint, wipe it off, dampen it again and clean it in clean water. Lift out some paint. What I love about watercolor is the ability to do that and then respect the paint. 
and its interaction with the paper. Assume that it knows what to do and leave it alone and let it do its thing. In other words, less is more. The less you do with this, the better the results. Now, I will dapple it a little using some salt. Right about here. and down here. I'm wetting this petal, which I will apply the color to, and I've allowed the adjacent petals to dry thoroughly before I do this, because I don't want the paint flowing from one petal to the other. I want each petal to remain a distinct individual shape. Now I'm looking at my photo, and I see the deep red in this area. I'm going to add to that a touch, strong touch of magenta. And on the top, it whitens out to a bluish white. I think I'd even like to add a little of that blue in here. I'll let it bleed on its own. And possibly move it around a bit. What I would like to do is establish that center vein that we see in the actual flower. This is what I'm talking about. Each petal has a center line that I definitely want to work into my watercolor. It enhances the look of the petal. Right now my petals have a flat look to them. Plus they need the introduction of the shadows, which I'll use a cobalt blue wash to achieve that. To work in the center line, I'm going to use a wash, a very light wash of quinacridone magenta. Before I do that, I'm going to dampen where I want that line to be. Right there. If you don't brush too much, you can wet your watercolor after it's thoroughly dry without lifting up what's underneath. Now, we take the magenta and flow it in. I'll also apply more water. Why do I do that? Because I want to flow the color to that center line. I'm also going to apply a little bit more magenta down here and allow it to bleed up to accentuate the feeling of shadow as I move into this area. I will leave it alone. Eventually, when that's bone dry, I'm going to do the same thing from this side. Having done that there, I can move up to this area and do the same thing. Make a light line indicating where I want it to go. Then I'll dampen it. And flow my magenta. And I add plain water, hoping to push some of the pigment to the edge to create a nice edge line. Before I develop the painting any further, it's time to mask out the filaments and the anthers 
This way I can very easily paint in the back petals without needing to go around the detail of the filaments and the anthers. I use this masking material that I've listed in my supply list. A tip when you're using the material comes in jars, of course. Do not shake it vigorously before using. I gently rock it back and forth. Why do I do that? Because the material, you could even see it here, the material contains a pigment and of course the masking material. The pigment is there so when you apply it to the paper, let me show you, You recognize that if you've watched my jewelry videos. Those are cutouts for a watercolor pendant. There you go. It's pigmented so you can see where you apply it. Another important thing to keep in mind. When you're working with the material, have some soapy water nearby. You want to clean out the brush in soapy water. And please don't use a good brush. I use brushes that are slightly damaged because inevitably any brush that you use with this masking material gets ruined. Now one other thing I wanted to show you, I said gently shake it. Don't shake it vigorously and, and this is why. If we zoom in there, see the bubbles? Now all I did is rock it back and forth lightly, but if you shake it vigorously, the whole thing foams up and it'll be impossible for you to stick your brush in there and, and use it. The bubbles dissipate. Another tip in regard to using a masking material is putting the masking fluid in a squeeze bottle like this it permits me to apply it in a way that I can never do with a brush. So you may want to consider it. And you do have to make sure you keep the nozzle very clean. But I, I think it's worth the effort. Look at that. You can never apply fluid like that with a brush. With our materials ready, my paintbrush, the soapy water, I'll begin to flow the masking fluid on. And here's what I'm talking about. I use a quite a large amount of fluid and I flow it in place. What is the masking fluid? What kind of material is it? It happens to be a latex rubber compound. Be aware of that. If you have allergies to latex rubber, you want to use caution when using this material. Clean your brush frequently to eliminate any buildup of masking material. Wipe it off and continue. Since I'm at it, I'm going to cover this for a moment and take the squeeze bottle to demonstrate how I would continue with this. I want that anther to be loaded with masking material. What you just watched me do is apply some of the masking material with the squeeze bottle rather than the brush. Then what I, I needed to do is to use my brush to spread it around a bit. Let's continue with that method. 
I flow the masking material. Then I take my brush. That is a very effective way of applying the masking fluid. Having applied the masking material, I'll now plug up this hole with my wire. Easier on the hands to use a pair of pliers. I just want to make certain that that wire goes well into the bottle. Beautiful. And what I need to do now before I can continue to paint is just leave it alone. That has to dry. How do you know if it's dry? when the masking fluid will become totally transparent. Sometimes I allow the fluid to dry overnight because if I'm not sure, I'd rather play it safe. If you begin to paint into a wet area of masking fluid, you can have big problems. The other thing that I need to point out is your watercolor ne needs to be completely dry before you apply the masking fluid. And this is something else that often I will wait till the next day before I do. Just to guarantee my paper is dry. If the paper has the slightest bit of moisture in it, that masking fluid will embed into the paper if it's painted on a wet area. And you ruined your piece. You're never getting it out. We'll leave it alone. Come back later.